Zach Carter is joining us. He's from the Media Consortium, uh, and he's written about uh, corporate cash and its effects on this election cycle, which is plentiful. Uh, Zach, welcome to the Young Turks. Thanks for having me, Chink. Uh, Zach, before we do anything else, uh, people might not be familiar. Tell us what the Media Consortium is. All right, the Media Consortium is a coalition of independent media outlets, uh, places like Mother Jones, The Nation, and The American Prospect, uh, focused on independent coverage of the issues that, uh, that affect everybody. Uh, I've been writing a blog on campaign finance. It's called Campaign Cash. You can check it out at themediaconsortium.org, and you can follow the conversation on Twitter at uh, the hashtag pound campaign cash. All right. All this sounds quite dangerous. Sounds good. All right. So let's talk about campaign cash. Um, uh, what is the degree to which it is flooding uh, the election cycle this time around? Is it really significantly more than in past elections? Well, that's really astonishing. So, uh, you know, corporate money has always been in elections to some degree, but it's been divorced from the actual, uh, you know, corporate coffers themselves. People who work for corporations sort of uh, unite to, to pledge their own money. This cycle, thanks to the Supreme Court's ruling in Citizens United, corporations can spend unlimited amounts from their own treasury funds uh, on to directly influence elections. Uh, and so far, we've seen about $400 million in, in, in outside group spending on the elections. That's uh, Four hundred million dollars that didn't exist last year. That's a lot of money. Now, some theorize that it might be billionaires who would like to pay less taxes. Now, that's <laughs> not true, is it, Zach? <laughs> well, think about it. Who does it benefit when you, when you get to uh, spend unlimited amounts of funding on something? Uh, people who have unlimited amounts of funding to spend. So uh, poor people can't go and make uh, a seven million dollar donation uh, to to support uh, whatever policies they like and attack candidates they they don't like. Uh, rich people can. So uh, there, there's a lot of money coming from very wealthy people. Uh, we just saw the the swift boat billionaire behind uh, you know, that, that helped derail John Kerry in 2004 is at it again. He made a seven million donation to uh, a group uh, run by Karl Rove. That's just a donation we know about because it was an explicitly political organization. He, he could be spending you know, who knows how much on, through other front groups because these front groups don't have to disclose who their donors are or how much they're spending. Who is that, Zach? Uh, that's Bob Perry. He's a real estate magnate from uh, Texas. Right. And uh, there's uh, another set of billionaires, the Koch brothers. Um, now, they get mentioned a lot. Uh, there's good reason for that, isn't there? Oh, they're behind all sorts of things from... Uh, pharmaceuticals to uh, derivatives trading and crazy high finance on Wall Street. Uh, they're a big force behind the Tea Party, two of the big groups that uh, organize a lot of the Tea Party events, Freedom Works and, and uh, the Americans, Americans for Prosperity. Prosperity. Yeah, Americans for Prosperity. Uh, they're both founded by, by the Koch brothers, and uh, they do a lot of work with Fox News, <laughs> with Fox News celebrities going out and, uh, and promoting these these Americans for Prosperity and Freedom Works events, and then in return, the Fox News uh, celebrities get to go to the events and talk and become very, very famous with uh, the the audience created by the Koch brothers' money. It's a it's a little incestuous game between Rupert Murdoch and his uh, his billionaire buddies at uh, at Koch Industries. Now, uh, to be fair, it's not just Rupert Murdoch. The second largest shareholder of uh, Fox News is Prince uh, Alawid. Mm -hmm. And he also, and what does he have? Oh, right, he has Saudi money. What is Saudi? Oh, right, oil, huh? <laughs> Not now, just oil, oil. he was uh, one of the biggest shareholders in Citigroup as well. Right, a and finance. Those <laughs> seem to be, uh, those seem to come up a lot. But talk to us about that. I mean, how many oil companies are on the Chamber of Commerce, for example, that's spending an, a record amount of money in these elections? And what would they have to gain by spending all this money? Well, uh, Kate Shepard at Mother Jones had an interesting piece this week pointing out that there were, uh, I believe, 14 uh, foreign oil companies uh, that belong to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a funny group. It sounds like, uh, you know, some sort of local philanthropic organization that uh, just supports the local economy, but it's actually uh, basically a front route for the largest corporations in America and many of the largest corporations around the world. Uh, and all of these companies have plenty to gain from, uh, from the U.S. political process. If you can, uh, if you can thwart... Uh, if you're an oil company, for instance, and you can you can thwart uh, environmental regulations, then you can make money polluting. Uh, and people all over the all over the world have an interest in doing that, uh, even though people all over the world uh, you know can suffer as a result. And you know, and if there's foreign corporations uh, that are giving money uh, to the United States because they'd like to pollute, but it winds up polluting us, the American people. Well, that's a happy coincidence for them, but not so happy for us. Right. That, that's that's the problem. I mean, you think that. Uh, some of the immediate effects of pollution would, would hit home here and, and maybe not in, in other countries where, uh, 
or this might be spent. Now, we don't really know what's going on at the, at the, the Chamber of Commerce. So that we do know they have these, these foreign corporations who are members, uh, but we don't know how much they're spending uh, because the U.S. Chamber of Commerce doesn't have to disclose that as a result of, their, of the Citizens United ruling. So none of, the, uh, none of the, the, the corporations who are pouring money through these front groups uh, have any sort of public accountability as a result. They're doing it completely in secret. Uh, and that's that's a, a huge problem. We know it, it was at least four hundred million dollars that's just been funneled through the uh, the process in secret so far. That that seems like a gross affront to the democratic process. And uh, there's one other issue here that you brought up that I hadn't seen before. We're talking to Zach Carter from the Media Consortium. Um, you know, you say, look, if these outside groups get stronger and stronger and have more and more money, that also has an effect on the political parties. T t tell me more about that. Well, it's the interesting, one of the interesting things, there are many interesting things about Citizens United, but uh, it, it created this whole new uh, right for corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money on elections, but it also uh, restricted the political party's uh, right to do the exact same thing. So actually the Republican Party and the Democratic Party can't spend money to directly promote or uh, decry individual candidates, but corporations can. So as a result, uh, we've ceded party away for, uh, power away from the, uh, from the political parties toward corporate America. Now, political parties are not the most popular organizations in the United States right now, but they at least have to reach out to voters, and they, they are publicly accountable to the public, whereas corporations are only accountable to their shareholders, who can often make money doing things that are totally detrimental to the public interest. So there's a shift in, in power here away from the political process that's moving towards the, uh, the corporate boardrooms. And by the way, they're often not accountable to their shareholders either. Corporations usually have runaway executives who just pack the board with their buddies. But what did Eisner have? I think had his dentist and his kids' uh, basketball coach on his board uh, of Disney when he ran Disney. Well, I mean, look at all the bonuses that were paid out on Wall Street during the course of the housing bubble, so that these executives could run their companies into the ground and decimate their shareholders. Right. And, and by the way, I, I have many friends on w Wall Street. I'm not, you know, I don't play the game of like you know, they're the bad guys or anything like that, the whole industry is the bad guys. But at the same time, one of them said to me, he's like, but in what other industry uh, do you just get to keep, uh, as in finance, you just get to keep 50% of the profits for the, uh, all, and not just for the employees, <laughs> but for the very, very top employees, for the top executives. Mm -hmm. He's like, and they do that because they're not really that accountable to their shareholders, so they take the shareholders' money and put it in their pocket. Well, that, and at the banks, they're also too big to fail, right? So, uh, you know, the shareholders even have a sense, there's a sense in which uh, they, they want to incentivize uh, their, their managers to, to take big risks, because if they backfire, uh, then they can count on taxpayers bailing them out. Yeah, uh, but, they're, but they're in favor of the free market, which is a joke. <laughs> now, right. now, and, and that's what, and look, this is what the heart of this problem is, which is that they claim to be in favor of the free market, the Tea Party years, et cetera, all at the market decide, et cetera. Meanwhile, they're being financed by the guys who rigged the market and who are in the process of buying the market and buying the cops so that they can rig it forever. Right. That, that, I mean, you know, you see all these Tea Partiers who are really upset about the Wall Street bailout, and with, with good cause, I would say. Uh, but uh, the Tea Party itself is being financed by Wall Street. The 12 Senate candidates have received $4.6 million from Wall Street alone this cycle. Uh, and they're they're being and all this outside money is pouring into uh, in, into the Tea Party races from we have no idea who because again it's a secretive process thanks to the Citizens United ruling and they're they're financing candidates they're going to allow corporate America to feed off of taxpayers and the government. Zach, let me get that uh, again. Four point six million dollars and who did that four point six million go to? To the twelve uh, leading Tea Party Senate candidates. So, Christine O'Donnell, uh, Sharon Engel. Uh, Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, all, the, the 12, 12 big right. ones, they're all being uh, financed in addition by uh, Jim DeMint and his uh, political action campaign committee. Uh, but that's $4.6 million straight from Wall Street uh, <laughs> to a dozen candidates, uh, some of which are you know, fairly fringe candidates who, who probably don't have a good shot at winning. Some of them do, unfortunately, because they've got all of this money from Wall Street. Well, you know, that, I talk about that in regards to Christine O'Donnell and Joe Miller, for example. For example, Christine uh, Joe, Joe Miller got $600,000 for his primary fight. How do you think he won, right? <laughs> and Christine O'Donnell had been running in Delaware forever uh, as a witch or non-witch or whatever she was doing, and she was laughed out of the race every single time, except this time she wins the primary. How? She got a lot of money. Right. You know, and where did that money come from? Uh, from the guys who got the bailouts? 
for candidates who are pretending to be against the bailouts. Yeah, and it's not just the Tea Party candidates who are going around, uh, you know, screaming about bailouts while accept, ex accepting money from from bailed out banks. I mean, Mitch McConnell, just about everybody in the Republican leadership, uh, and and several people in the Democratic leadership as well, uh, are, are getting a lot of money from Wall Street right now, and from you know other other industries like the uh, the auto auto dealers or not auto dealers, the uh, the car companies that uh, receive taxpayer money as well. You know, I read an article from Jimmy McMillan. He's the, the rent is too damn high uh, <laughs> party leader in New York. Uh, and he made a good point. He's like, these are the free market failures. And, and you know, and we talk about this all the time, that they are failures in the free market when all the banks went bankrupt. Uh, they just make up for by buying the politicians. And that's precisely what they're doing now, backed by the people who pretend to be in favor of the free market. It's maddening. And Right. Well, and a big problem too is that uh, you know the Wall Street issues, the, the GM issues, these these all happened before Citizens United, right? So things have gotten significantly worse now, and corporations can funnel their money through secret front groups who don't have to disclose who their donors are. So corporations can do all of this in in the dark without any accountability. That's a huge, huge problem. So it's and it's not just you know it's not just Wall Street. You know, you see the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, for instance, one of the big big front groups here for for corporate America. Uh, during the health care reform debate, the insurance companies would go out and say, oh, oh, we, we support reform, while funneling money to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to run attack ads against the health care reform bill. Same thing happened with, with BP. You know, they're a member of the Chamber of Commerce. They publicly say, we support the, you know, we'll, we'll pay to clean this up. We support, you know, fixing this. But the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, interestingly, was just out lobbying very hard against BP having to, uh, to clean up the mess. No, that's a strange coincidence. I wouldn't have expected that. <laughs> All right, we're talking to Zach Carter of the Media Consortium. I want to ask you one last thing, uh, Zach. Um, and it's regarding Obama. Like, we elected the guy for change, right? Big change, real change, change you can believe in, et cetera. Uh, you know, I know that there's no way of you knowing this, but I just want to have a conversation about it. I mean, do you think he gets that, like, this was it? This was the change? Like, that it's not, I mean, all the issues are good. Hey, you got 5% change in well, Wall Street reform and 10% change in health care reform. But you're missing the giant picture. The giant picture is this, where the, the system is deeply corrupt because all of our politicians get bought. That's what we wanted you to change. Do you think he just doesn't understand that? Or he does and goes, ah, it's too hard, I'm going to ignore it. I think he has an awful lot on his plate <laughs> when he came into office, but I, you know, guessing the president's psychology is not easy. He's done some things that that are really good and bold and pro progressive. I mean, appointing Elizabeth Warren to, to head the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, getting the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau through Congress—that's great. Uh, but you know, Wall Street reform is an area where I've done a lot of reporting, so I, I'm more familiar with it. But you know, too big to fail is still a huge problem, and we're seeing it playing out right now in, in the mortgage market. The foreclosure problem is still out of control, and it appears that there's been ramp rampant fraud committed in that process as well. So I, I think, I think uh, every president has to deal with living in a sort of White House bubble with a, a set of advisors that he chooses. And, uh, you know, some of his advisors I don't think have been particularly progressive. So the, the information he's getting uh, is, is not, uh, not the sort that we'd like. The good news is there is a very vibrant independent media out there where the public can get information, uh, and I would strongly encourage them to, to do that. On campaign finance, one way to, to access it is through the mediaconsortium.org at the campaign cash blog. But there are all sorts of publications, you know, your show, Grit TV, Mother Jones, The Nation, uh, great publications that, uh, that are, are on the case. All right. Well, we'll leave it on that encouraging note. Zach, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Shane.